نحمده و نسلي على رسول الكريم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to another episode of سيرة خاتم النبيين the biography of the seal of the prophets the seal of prophethood Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم if you recall from the last episode I just recited to you سورة الفيل in which we were talking about the individuals who had authority and power over elephants and how it seemed, as I was implying, they were absolutely adamant and going out in order to destroy the Kaaba. How did that come about? Why? Well, we'd already mentioned that Abraha had plans beyond just destroying, uh, beyond just taking over Yemen, as he had done by removing his four his counterpart out of the way until he had power over Yemen. He wanted to eventually subjugate the Arab people and accept the religion that he had brought and accept the way of life that he had brought from Abyssinia, which is around present-day Ethiopia. Those were his plans. And we were talking as well in the last episode about this church that he'd built, this uh, al Quleis church, and he, had, he was quite proud of this church. And he had written to uh, King Negus, uh, the king of Abyssinia and explained to him that look nobody will build a church of this liking or this size or this quality ever and he says I will not cease in making effort in trying to bring the Arabs towards this so what he did was he as this church was getting built we remember or you may recall uh, the church or the the palace that was built for Bilqis uh, it was mentioned in the Quran and what he did was he started to move bits and pieces of this palace <coughs> in order to add it to his uh, church marble stone furnishings the gold and silver that was used there ivory ebony all the types of material all the types of resources which we associate with glamour which we associated with greatness he had tried to bring in order to put this together and al Quleis was a if architectural feat, an outstanding piece of architecture, it stood there, very spacious, tall, it brought about the awe which Abraha was after. He wanted to show the power and authority both of the religion and his way of life. And <coughs> there were also, even though he came from a Christian background and he had accepted the Christian faith, there was still somewhat a bit of idolatry within his veins as such because when this building was built it was built with the names of two idols one is Qaib and his wife and he built these two idols and there were uh, statues of them and they were exceptionally tall uh, uh, statues of them so the Yemenis didn't feel even though they understood the religion which had been brought before the teachings of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam what they saw now was a mixture within that religion, something which was not part of the religion, something which came from outside of the religion, something which they themselves or their forefathers had adopted and practiced before the teachings of Isa Islam came. So they, in essence, largely abandoned this uh, church and had nothing to do with it. <clears throat> this church existed up until the time of uh, one of the first of the Abbasid Khalifs, and then, he, then this was eventually destroyed. So when people became aware of Abraha's plan, his plan to destroy the Kaaba, his plan to divert all the Arabs towards uh, Yemen, his plan to push his understanding of Isa al-Islam's teachings, which was largely Christianity mixed with idolism, idol worship or idolatry, there was, there was still within it the two idols that he built so he wasn't absolutely free from there. So he wanted to push this throughout the Arabian Peninsula. But he didn't just want to push it <coughs> as, his, uh, as his way. Uh, he wanted to push it a, from a religious perspective, but also from a perspective of power and authority. And in fact, religion was being used to establish that power and authority. Abraham had plans. So when uh, certain tribes heard of this, especially the Kinana tribe, they became very angry with this. That who, who does this person think he is? Because if you recall, at this time there was idol worship going on in the Kaaba itself as well. Who does this person think he is? He's going to come and destroy our house, our place of worship. 
who, and what makes him think that his place of worship is, is better, is superior. And one particular Kinan, uh, uh, member of the Kinan tribe, he went to this Kulesh church and he defecated in a corner and then left. So when Abraham was found out, he said, you know, who's done this? Where did this happen? Who, who is this person who's done this disgusting act in such a clean and pure place? A place of religious, a place of religion, a place of solitude, a place of worship. The people around them mentioned, look, we did see a chap here from the Canaan tribe. And uh, they referred to in those days as the people of the Beit, as in Beit meaning the building in Makkah, because he was given a name, which was Beit House. And he says, basically, when this tribe heard of your plans or your intentions, A, that you were going to destroy the Kaaba, and B, that you were going to move the Arabs' pilgrimage away from where it's always been for centuries. You're going to move the center of the Arabian Peninsula away from Makkah and push it towards Yemen. Then, obviously, this is what he did. He became hang angry and and, he, and this is why he came to defile it, to say that this place isn't really worthy of substituting and eventually replacing the Kaaba. Abraham wasn't going to take this lying down. Obviously, we know Abraham's nature now. He was, became exceptionally angry and he said, right, I'm going to go and actually destroy this Kaaba once and for all. So he gathered together his Abyssinian troops and they equipped themselves, got ready to go. And he set forth with his elephant. Now, when the Arabs heard of this animal, this animal, which is two, three times as big as a camel, more stronger in terms of uh, uh, being able to carry, fearless, uh, which uh, even a camel is fearless, but this elephant was even more so fearless, then it put the fear into the hearts of the tribes. And the Arabs became very alarmed and, and very uh, <clears throat> frightened from what was potentially going to happen. But when they heard what the plan was for Abraha, that Abraha's plan was to actually destroy the Kaaba, then they felt they had no choice but to defend it. And we have an individual who took up this cause, which was uh, from Yemeni uh, descent, uh, Dhu Nafal, and he gathered his people together and said, before Abraha reaches the Kaaba, we'll engage in battle and hopefully kill him. But it wasn't to be. Abraha was a trained general, a very powerful man. His army was well trained. Uh, and as they did, as they came across, Dhu Nafar and his supporters were completely annihilated and killed. In fact, Dhu Nafar was taken as a prisoner and he was brought in front of Abraha. When he was about to be killed, Dhu Nafar used his intellect and his opportunity to, take, to get himself out of this bother. And he said, look, I'll be useful to you. And in fact, I'll be more useful to you alive than I will be useful to you dead. So Abra kept him as a prisoner waiting for this opportunity as to when he'll be useful. And he continued to go further north, heading towards Mecca. And he met adversaries and small armies along the way, mainly tribal armies. And when he came into an area called Khatham, he came up against Nufail ibn Habib al-Khathami. And they were allied with two other tribes, the Shahran and the Nahis tribe, with some other smaller tribes. They also did battle expecting to at least stop Abraha's onslaught towards Makkah. But again, Abraha won, and as we saw with Dhu Nafar, Nufail was taken as a prisoner. Again, when Nufail was about to be executed, Nufail obviously pleaded for his life as well, and he offered to be the guide. He says, look, you don't know the Arab territory like I know it. I can save you days in traveling. I can avoid places where there could be armies waiting for ambush. And I will be a faithful guide and I will get you to Mecca. That seemed like a good offer to Abraha. So Abraha said, fine. Uh, what he did, he goes, I will set you free. You go ahead and you'll act as a guide. If you see that there's armies uh, planning to attack us or waiting in ambush, you'll come back, inform us, and then you'll direct us towards another route. <clears throat> as Abraha carried on, in near Taif, he met somebody else. Masood ibn Muttalib ibn Malik ibn Kab ibn Amr ibn Saad ibn Uf ibn Thaqif and the warriors of the Thaqif as well. They uh, addressed Abraha. And what they said was they took the other option. They realized that anybody who stood up against Abraha has not been successful. They've lost those battles. It hasn't worked out well. So they tried a different tact. They said, oh, king, 
We are your slaves. We are obedient to you. We have no dispute with you. And the temple uh, of ours is not the one you want, meaning the one that was already existed. By this they meant the temple which was devoted to the goddess Alat, which was in Taif. What you want, this is not the right building, because obviously Abraha had not seen the Kaaba. To him it was a house which the Arabs go to, so they'd make pilgrimage to. So the people of Taif were saying to him that, look, this is not the one that you're looking for. This is our goddess, Allah. We're idol worshippers. The one you're looking for is the building in Mecca. That's the one you're looking for, because that is the one which the Arabs come to. And what we'll do to assist you and to show that we're with you and we're obedient slaves of yours is we will send some guides with you. So Abraham thought, no point getting into any fighting here. No point getting into any bother here. Let's take what's been said and move forward. So he left them. And this temple of Allah was the one they had in Taif, which was nearly as close as the way the Kaaba was venerated in those days. So it was challenging the status of the Kaaba. But it, it, it was mainly those who accepted Allah being one of the uh, main god, uh, gods or, or goddesses that the idol worshippers would worship in those days. So Thaqif sent uh, with Abraha Abu Rigal as a guide to Mecca to get him into Mecca. And they travelled and they made as far as a place called al Muhammis where they stopped. And it was there obviously Abu Rigal passed away. Uh, and he was he 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 died there, uh, and that's where his his sort of story finished. When Abraha reached uh, or stopped or was stopping at Muhammis, he sent on ahead to Mecca one of his Abyssinian men, and his name was Al Aswad ibn Maqsud, uh, with some cavalry. And what they did is they came into uh, what they did was they brought to him the possessions of the Hama from Quraysh and others, and in there were two hundred camels belonging to Abdul Muttalib. Now Abdul Muttalib ibn Hisham, ibn Hashim rather, Abdul ibn uh, Abdul Muttalib is the grandfather of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, because the father of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is Abdullah. So here you're beginning to see now the story coming together, especially with Abraha now on the scene, and intertwining with the life of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, obviously well before his time. So these two hundred camels that they're taken. The scouting party had taken belonged to Abdul Muttalib ibn Hashim, and he was the leader and the elder of Quraysh at the time, which again shows the rank and status of the family and the tribe which Prophet Muhammad sallallahu came from. He came from the elite. He came from the absolute top notch. Why? Well, there's many hikmat, there's many wisdoms in, due to it. One that I will mention to you right now is to establish his authority. That he was not coming from some lower class individual. He was a high class individual coming from a people who are naturally leaders, coming from a people who are uh, educated uh, and strong, uh, have strength in heart and conviction in their approach, and also wis have wisdom within them and have foresight. And this is the, the this is the sort of background from where the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was born, which obviously he needed all these skills in order to be the leader that he became. So, there were a number of people who thought about tackling Abraha. The Quraysh tribe, the Kinana tribe and the Hudayl tribe. We've already mentioned the Kinana tribe who took major issue and it was one of their members who actually then went and defecated in the church al Qulays. The Quraysh tribe were the main tribe in Mecca and obviously they highly regarded the Kaaba and also the Hudayl tribe. But the problem they had was when they looked at the army of Abraha and what they'd already done in their wake since leaving Yemen, they didn't feel they had sufficient power to match him. And this would have just been another group of Arabs that would have been annihilated. So Abraha then sent Hunatha the Himyarite to Mecca with the following instruction. He said, find the leader and the most noble of these people. Tell them that the king says, I have not come to wage war with you, but I have only come to destroy the Kaaba. If you do not engage in any war or prevent access, then I have got no need to destroy you or kill you. If he doesn't want war, then bring him, to, bring him with you as well. Now, Abraham was an astute general. 
He didn't need to get, if he didn't need to get into war, there was no need to. Where it could be avoided, it was avoided. His main goal, his main objective had been not to destroy and kill people because eventually he wanted to rule over these people. He wanted to conquer those people. And by killing, then there would always be people who wanted to take revenge. By just destroying the Kaaba, he was saying, look, I'm just destroying this and I'm giving you something better in replace of it, in his eyes, which is the church al Qulais. And now you can come down to Yemen and the building is more magnificent. It's got, you know, material which you've never seen. It's huge. It's spacious. It's tall. It's awe-inspiring. It's jaw-dropping. And that's what a place of worship, that's what a place of pilgrimage should be. That was his aim. I've got no beef with you. I've got no issue with you. My main concern is to destroy the Kaaba. So this message was given to Hunatha, the Hemianite, to take to the leader. So when he entered Mecca, he asked for the leader of Quraysh because the Quraysh tribe were considered as the elite tribe within. They were the tribe of the leaders within Mecca. So they asked and he was directed to the grandfather of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, Abdul Muttalib Ibn Hashim. And so he passed on Abraha's message and Abdul Muttalib replied. He said, we don't want war either. We don't have the capabilities or to stand against him. Um, so there's no point us going to war. This house is, uh, is God's house, this house is Allah's house and if he's, and if he's a true follower of Ibrahim uh, and, it's, uh, then, you know, and this and that of his true follower Ibrahim. So this is the house which Ibrahim built, this is the house which Allah requested to be built. So you're talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first of all and then Ibrahim who is considered as the father of at least the three faiths which I even refer to as the Abrahamic faiths and also faiths, uh, others which have also adopted Ibrahim So even the idol worshippers had accepted Ibrahim as a pious man, as a great leader. So basically what he was saying in other words, uh, if Allah SWT chooses to protect it, then he will choose to protect his house. It's his house to protect. But if Allah SWT chooses not to protect it, then he chooses not to protect it. So obviously the message that was given to Hunata was that if the leader of this particular group of people choose not to go to war, choose not battle, then ask him to accompany you and bring him to me. So that's what was done. So Abdul Muttalib set off and he took some of his sons with him. And when he arrived at uh, the encampment, he asked to see Dhu Nafar, who was a companion of his. When he met him, he was in confinement, he was in jail. So he asked him, uh, you know, what about their predicament, how they could solve the problem. He says, how can a man who give you a solution when he is the king's prisoner expecting to be killed at any time. I have no advice to give you, except, he gave him some information, that Unes, who is the elephant keeper, is a friend of mine. And I'll send him a message strongly commending you and asking to seek permission for you to address the king. And then you talk to him as you see fit. So Abdul Muttalib agreed and the message was sent to Unes and it was mentioned and this message got to the uh, uh, Abraha, that Abdul Muttalib is the leader of Quraysh and he's the custodian of the well. This is referring to the Dhamzam uh, of Mecca. And he feeds both men and animals. And the king has taken 200 of his camels, which we already mentioned, and he wants permission to seek, speak to the king in order to intercede. So when Unes got this message across to Abraha, that there's this great leader who comes here and he wants to come and discuss something with you. Then Abraha said, fine, you know, if, he's, if, he has, if he says, if he is as you describe him, then he's a man of morals, he's a man of character, he's a man of honesty, he's a giving man, he's a charitable man, uh, and he's a leader, then fine, yes. So Abdul Muttalib came and they spoke to one another. And when they spoke to one another, he told him, that what is it that you want to address to the king, the interpreter, because uh, Abraha could not speak Arabic. So Abdul Muttalib said, what I want is for the king to return my 200 camels that he took from me. So the uh, translator did that and um, the king said to him, King Abra Abra said to him, that when I saw you, you know, I was impressed by you. And in fact, it's mentioned in a number of reports that the king actually re re got off his throne because it didn't feel appropriate because of the dignified and status and the way this man was presenting himself. He didn't feel it was appropriate that the man should sit on the floor whilst he sits on a throne. 
So what he did was he got off the throne in order to be able to sit on the carpet on level terms. So he said, look, when you came in, I was very impressed by you. I saw a man, a statesman-like man, a man in charge, a man of authority, a man of dignity. Yet, you have displeased me when you spoke. The reason why you displeased me when you spoke is you came to ask me about 200 camels, but not about the building and the, your religion, which is your, the building which symbolizes your religion and symbolizes the religion of your ancestors, which I've come to destroy. You come to ask me regarding 200 camels, which a man of your stature and your position is... Even if you lost 200 camels, it wouldn't be long before you made them back. Yet, you're not asking me about what I'm actually here for, which is to destroy the Kaaba. So, Abdul Muttalib responded with a remarkable response, which shows the stature, stature rather, and nature of the man. He said, look, I'm here only for the camels because I'm the owner of the camels. The building has its own master and he will, if he chooses, protect it. So, Abraha, as with most leaders, became very arrogant. He said, he won't protect it from me. You know, I've, he didn't say this, but I'm sort of reading between the lines. What he was suggesting here is, you know, I've come from Yemen. I've destroyed every tribe that stood up against me. Any tribe, which, any tribe which didn't stand up against me have already accepted and given their pledge of allegiance to me and accepted me as a king. There is nobody standing in my way. In fact, you and the tribe of Quraysh and uh, Kinan and uh, the uh, Hudayl, even you can't stand up against me. You've openly said that, that you will not go to war against me because you do not have power to go against me. And now you're saying that I can't destroy, now that everything is out of the way, every hurdle is out of the way, you're telling me now that I can't destroy the Kaaba. Abdul Muttalib responded with calmness as before. He said, that's a matter which is between you and him, Yani Allah. So as Abraha was a man of his word and he had come, Abdul Muttalib had come to ask for his camels, so he returned his camels to him. And uh, he then took these camels away. A group of people met together, came up with a solution, and the solution they said was that what we'll do is we'll give you one third of the produce of Tihama every year. Whenever there's a harvest, we will give you one third of whatever we produce. The only thing we ask of you is not to destroy this building. Abraha refused. What need did he have for money? He was a powerful man now and he'd already seen that there was hardly anybody offering any resistance to him from all the way from Yemen to Mecca and those neighboring areas. So he knew how powerful he was. So he had all of that. He didn't need a produce, a third. If he wanted, he could take it all. What he came was, his goal was to destroy the Kaaba. So when they left, Abraham, obviously Abdul Muttalib gathered the senior members of Quraysh and told them, look, this person is absolutely adamant in destroying the building, destroying the Kaaba. There's no way we can stop him. The best thing what we can do is take up some defensive positions out in the mountains. So at least we can protect, uh, protect our families. At least we can protect ourselves. So if this man was to change his mind, he wouldn't be able to kill us and our families. But we can't really stop him from destroying the Kaaba. Then Abdul Muttalib took hold of the metal door knocker on the Kaaba and stood there and he, with a group from the Quraysh and he prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He asked for his help against Abraha and his army and he stood and hold, held on to this. And he said, or words to that effect, O oh Allah, your worshippers protect their homes, so protect your building. Let not their religion and their power vanquish yours tomorrow. And if you should leave them free with our Qibla, then that is what you will. Meaning if, if you do, if it is destroyed, then that is your choice. He then released the Kaaba door and went off along with his men of Quraysh to the mountain peaks, taking up defensive positions. What happened next? Well, I'm sorry to say, but we've run out of time. So I won't be able to go into what actually took place after that little episode. It seems there is nothing now stopping Abraha from destroying the Kaaba. All lines of defenses are down. All offers have been refused, offers of money, Offers of servitude, offers of giving him kingship over the lands, all been refused. It seems Abraha is adamant of destroying the Kaaba. And now it seems nothing stands in his way. Was the Kaaba destroyed? Was this house that was built by the angels originally, and then by Adam Islam, and then again by Ibrahim Islam, was this to be the end? Or 
as we've already alluded to in Surah Al-Fil, was there something else that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had planned? Was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala going to protect his own house and in a way defend the religion which would then eventually be the coming of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and he would then remove idol worship from the Arabian Peninsula. For that and to carry on the rest of our Sirat al Khatam and Nabiyin, you're going to have to join me again in the next episode. I hope you can. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.